It is good to be with you again. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, we did have some difficulty getting here. Who was here last night? All right, just about everybody. That's awesome. Well, we're going to get into the Word again today, and uh, man, Dustin, that was amazing. Praise God, that worship was awesome. I was, I was dancing prophetically in my heart, <laughs> prophetically dancing very hardcorely right here. I'll tell you guys a quick funny story. Uh, so Bethel is a huge part of my life and a huge part of my story, and uh, God radically spoke to me at the prayer room in Reading at Bethel uh, one night, and one night I decided I'm just going to stay up all night and, and worship God, and I was thinking about Solomon and how because Solomon offered a radical offering of worship to God, God said to him, anything you want, I'm going to give it to you because of his radical worship. And so I just decided, man, one night I'm going to just go worship God and spend, spend all night worshiping God. And so I stayed up. It was like 2.30 in the morning, and there was nobody in there. And so I thought, if there was ever a time to try this prophetic dance thing, <laughs> this seems to be a safe place. <laughs> and so, like, there's worship music playing, and it's 2.30 in the morning, and so I, like, you know, I'm doing the best I can, just... Dancing, and then I get a little bit more heated and start jumping a little bit, so I start to sweat some. And kind of in the middle of that, I glance up, and there's a security camera right there, and I'm like, oh, oh God. Oh, I just want to shrink into a hole. <laughs> Not my gifting. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, we had a great time last night, and uh, if you didn't cry, <laughs> check your pulse, man. We were all just in tears, so... Oh, man, this morning, uh, I want to talk to you guys about the process to wholeness. The process to wholeness. So much of my message in the book that I wrote, uh, it's called Loving the Process to Wholeness, how all of us are on this journey, right? And how I define wholeness is giving up hope for a better past, which is forgiveness, relinquishing control for a perfect future, and then choosing joy encourage right where your feet are. That would be a profound way to live. <laughs> the process to wholeness. When I was playing for the Seahawks, Coach Carroll, he would always talk about this idea of focusing on the process. Focusing on the things that you have control over right in this very present moment. Like I got to be in two Super Bowl games, and the night before both of those games, our head coach would never say anything about winning the game. Nothing. It was, it was never really about winning the game. Because ultimately, to focus on the things that you don't have any control over is just going to create a ton of anxiety. <laughs> because there's really nothing I can do about it. So why focus on that? Why put all my effort into something that I have no control over? And in the same way, God calls us to focus on the things that he tells us to do because he only tells us to do things that we have the capability to do. The process to wholeness. If you have your Bible, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And it says, And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. Say, withered hand. Withered. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that your spirit is here. Thank you that you're speaking to us, God. I pray, pray that you would apply the word to our lives so that we may grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you guys ever done something that you felt like God told you to do and then just immediately regretted it? <laughs> immediately thought, man, this is way harder, this is way more challenging than I ever thought that it would be, it been obedient to do what God said to do, and then found yourself questioning that? Cool, just me. Um, <laughs> well, that happened to me. 
And it was one of those experiences in my life that I look back on and see God's hand in it. Because that's usually how it goes, right? It's like God tells us to do something. It makes no sense. We want to lean on our own understanding. And then you get a couple weeks or a couple months down the road, and you're like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. So I was the only long snapper who was invited to the NFL scouting combine. And the NFL scouting combine is basically this four-day long job interview where they wake you up at 4 o'clock in the morning and have you do all these ridiculous tests and personality tests, and they're watching everything. So they keep you up from like 4 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, and they're watching everything that you do. I mean, it's, it's kind of an insane, bizarre couple of days. It's very, very stressful. And so I was the only long snapper who was invited to this in the entire country. And so I kind of thought to myself, well, that's pretty amazing. They couldn't go out and find another guy for me to go and compete with. And so I assumed that because I was the only guy that was drafted, or the only guy that was invited, I was going to be drafted. Now, what happens if you don't get drafted in the NFL draft, there's seven rounds in the draft, if you don't get drafted, you go into what's called free agency. So free agency is basically, if there are 10 teams who are interested in you, and you pick one of them, and you pick incorrectly, <laughs> and that team fires you. Those other nine teams have all moved on, and you are out of luck, my friend, and you better go find another job, because that's how it goes. The NFL is moving fast, and if you don't hold on tight, you are out of luck. So it's a little stressful. It's much easier to just be the first long snapper in NFL history to be drafted in the first round. That would have been much more simple. That wouldn't have stretched my faith at all, right? <laughs> But that's not what happened. And so I go to the combine, and the team that I wanted to play for the most was the Houston Texans. Such a random team to want to play for, right? <laughs> Who wants to grow up and play for that team? I grew up in Texas. Uh, I grew up in Corpus Christi, which is about four hours south of Houston. My high school mascot was the Texan because in Texas, we're a little narcissistic like that. Forgive us. <laughs> we name our mascots after the state. That's ridiculous. And so that was my dream, to play for the Texans one day. And I remember, I'm at the Combine, and the special teams coach for the Texans is coming up to me and saying all this fantastic stuff. And he's like, man, we want to draft you. We want you to be our guy. We're getting rid of our old long snapper, and you're going to be our snapper for the next 40 years. It's going to be amazing. And he's telling me, you're the best long snapper that we have seen here in 10 years. And I'm hearing that, I'm kind of like, well, you know, I appreciate that. The best long snapper you've seen. That's kind of like saying, out of all of the hobbits in the land, you're the tallest. <laughs> Man, I swear, there is no hobbit taller than you, Clint Gresham. It's like, God, I'm the long snapper. There's not a whole lot of glory in that. I walk out on fourth down, I bend over, and I throw a football between my legs and hope that it ends up in the right spot. Not a whole lot of glory in that, <laughs> but I appreciated that. And I kind of filled in the gaps and leaned on my own understanding a little bit and thought that because he's being so nice to me and saying all this fantastic stuff, they're going to draft me, and that's how it's going to be. And we do that, don't we? We delight ourselves in the Lord and think that he's going to give us what we want. <laughs> Isn't that how that verse goes? I don't think so. And so the combine ends... And I go home, and about once a week, I'm getting calls from this coach. And he's telling me all this fantastic stuff, and, and finally the draft comes around. I didn't get a call in the first round. Very surprised by that. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> but I'm sitting on my couch, and it's the fifth round of the draft. In the previous years, that has been when a long snapper had been drafted. And I'm watching the TV, and this guy named Mel Kuyper, who's the draft expert, is, what, is talking about all this stuff. And he says the best pick available is Clint Gresham, long snapper from Texas Christian University. And this picture of me pops up on the screen, and I'm kind of just sitting there like, this is such a crazy, bizarre moment. I've watched this my whole life, and here's this guy talking about me. And while that happens, the ticker at the bottom of the screen says that the Houston Texans are on the clock my heart starts to beat faster. And all of a sudden, I look down at my phone, and my phone starts ringing. And it's a Houston area code. And so I'm shuddering in this moment. So I pick up the phone very eagerly, hello. 
And it's this gruff, grizzly old special teams coach. And he's like, hey, Clint, we just wanted to let you know uh, we're not going to be drafting you. And I'm like, you could have just not called, you know? <laughs> that would have perfectly communicated to me that you weren't going to be drafting me. Thanks for getting my hopes up, you jerk. So I hang up the phone, and I'm like, well, that was ridiculous. But the fifth round ends, the sixth round ends, the seventh round ends, and I have now gone into free agency exactly where I didn't want to be. Because now I have to turn off my phone, I have to spend time with God and find out where he wants me to go. Because the last thing that I want to do is to lean on my own understanding and go somewhere that God's not blessing. God wants us to do what he's blessing, not ask God to bless what we're doing. Amen? Amen? And so I'm on the phone with a mentor of mine, a spiritual father. The draft is over. I didn't get any other calls. And I ended up getting calls from five other teams after the draft, basically asking me to sign as a free agent. It was the Dolphins, the Ravens, the Saints, the Chiefs, and then the Texans. All of those teams were my options. And so I get on the phone with this mentor of mine, and we're kind of praying through this whole thing. And if I were to look at everything in the natural, everything in the natural pointed to going to Houston. It was my dream. I'd been talking about wanting to play for them for years. They were giving me almost three times the amount for a signing bonus of any other team, of what any other team was offering. It was a guarantee. It was everything that I had ever hoped for. And as I get on the phone with a mentor, a spiritual father, he's actually the man that I dedicated my book to, and on Father's Day of last year, he passed away, which is a kind of a beautiful, serendipitous thing because he was a father to so many people, and he passed away on Father's Day. But I get on the phone with him, and we're praying through this thing. And as we're praying, I hear this statement in my mind. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit. And I heard this statement, and it was, who's the only team in the nation whose name points to me, whose name speaks of my glory, whose name is prophetic. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, well, I, I know it's not the Patriots. <laughs> it's not the Patriots. And I'll tell you why it's not the Patriots. Because when you're in Super Bowl 49, okay, and you're in back-to-back -back Super Bowls, and you're on the one-yard line, and you're about to win another Super Bowl, and you throw an interception, and the Patriots end up winning another Super Bowl. It hurts. <laughs> Hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch. Anyways, when I'm in Seattle, everyone's like, yes, that's right, curse the Patriots. <sighs> Anyways, I am talking to a doctor about that. Dr. Finkel and I, Dr. Finkel and I, we're making strides. Some inner healing going on. <laughs> but I, I was thinking about that statement, and I thought, the saints. I realize that's kind of like a lucky, funny play on words, but God has done much weirder stuff in the Bible <laughs> for the people who are obedient to do what God said to do. And so I call up the special teams coach from the Texans, and I tell him, uh, hey, coach, so I spent some time in prayer. And I think I was kind of hoping for this attaboy type of moment, like, I spent some time with the Lord, and I feel like I'm... <laughs> and he was not impressed. He did not think that was some great holy moment. He was actually very angry with me. <laughs> but the last thing that I wanted to do was lean on my own understanding. And I felt like the Lord was saying to go to New Orleans, despite everything in the natural of that being a very bad idea. They had just won a Super Bowl. The long snapper that they had there was one of the best in the world at what he did. It made no sense in the natural, but I felt like that was what God said to do. And so I go to New Orleans and guys, it was the worst experience of my life. I hated it. I've never felt more alone. I've never felt more isolated. I've never felt more like I don't belong here. People don't even want me here. The kicker and the punter and the snapper, all those guys were best friends. And so I'm coming in trying to take their friend's job. So it's not like they're trying to love me up and get me to feel confident in my abilities. In fact, the snapper that was there, like he would say stuff to me trying to get in my head. And he's this 38-year-old guy like picking on this 23-year-old kid who's just trying to do the right thing. 
And isn't that what the devil does to us? He wants to get in your head. He wants to get you to doubt that you can't do what God told you to do when the truth is that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That is what the word of God says. And so we speak that over our lives and we declare that in faith even if we don't believe it in our hearts. And that's what I did pretty much all day long. I've never felt more alone. And that time forced me into a deep relationship with God. And guys, I realized that this is the process. This is the process, the refining ground, the wilderness season. Anyone who's ever done anything for God has always endured a process, has always endured a time in the wilderness, a time that gave the distinct message that what God said was going to happen was not going to happen. A time that we are forced to walk in faith. A time that we are forced to speak and declare what the word of God says over our lives, despite what our circumstances say, despite what the people around us say, despite what our even emotions say. Everybody has had to endure a process. Noah told to build an ark. Abraham waiting for his son. Jesus hanging on the cross. Mary carrying a baby in a society that stoned women for what it was perceived that she had done. All of them endured a temporary place of pain and discomfort for a long-term payoff. This is the process. God's process is always designed to make us whole in some capacity. And I've realized that many of us are carrying around wounds and hurts and disappointments because we're running from God's process. Because it's much easier to watch Netflix. It's much easier to get on Facebook and rant <laughs> than it is to talk about your insecurities. It's much easier to flip on a football game and veg out than it is to talk about your addictions. We all have this tendency to run from God's process and we sacrifice our opportunity of getting emotionally whole because we're afraid that if we turn back and allow this discomfort to sit there, maybe it's gonna be like this forever. Or if I let myself cry, maybe I'll never stop crying. And it feels terrifying. And the bravest person in the world is the person who can bring the things that they feel ashamed of and feel inadequate about and bring it out into the light. And we continue to fight the same fight year after year after year, and we accept the lie that maybe it's God's will to not heal me. Maybe, maybe this is just my lot in life. I'm going to be a victim forever. And that's a lie. Point number one is God's will is to make you whole yes. through a process. Yes. When you look at this dude with the withered hand, you have to imagine that this guy probably felt pretty insecure about his disability. Like, the fact that all these people in this room are all talking about his disability is probably a little bit embarrassing. It's probably a little bit humili humiliating. I remember when I was in high school, I had horrible acne. I had to take Accutane for five months, and it literally felt like an atomic bomb blew up on my face. And every single time I would walk into a room, I would feel like everybody in here thinks I'm hideous. Everybody in here is so disgusted with what they see, and that destroyed my self-esteem. And because I hated myself, <laughs> because I, all I saw was my ugliness, I treated my body poorly. Of course, if you don't like who you are, you're going to treat yourself horribly. So this guy was probably painfully aware of this disability that he had. In fact, there's a story when Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, is this guy blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus is such a gangster, he just doesn't even answer the guys. It's like, but the fact that that was even a question is kind of a bummer. Israel wasn't exactly the most emotionally healthy society. <laughs> there were a young nation still trying to figure it out. 
But if he is blind because he sinned, then for me to show any type of compassion on him is going to be contrary to the will of God. So now that allows me to step back and self-righteously judge this man because he deserves it. That's such a bummer. So this guy's got this withered hand. And what's so amazing to me is Jesus looks at him and he says, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. In other words, show me that thing that you feel ashamed of. Show me that thing that you feel ashamed of. And so this guy's probably like, you know, he's got this little flipper at his side. And he shows it to him, and boop, it gets restored as whole as the other. It gets restored back to wholeness as if it never happened because he had the courage to be vulnerable and show somebody the thing that he felt ashamed of. All of us have a withered hand in some capacity. Maybe it's an addiction to porn. Maybe it's an addiction to all kinds of things. All of us are carrying around these things we feel ashamed of. And all of the, what the, the devil wants to do is to get you isolated, get you alone. And Jesus is here and he's saying, I want you to show me that thing that you feel ashamed of. And if you will show it to me and bring things out into the light, I will restore you. I will make you whole. I will restore the years that the locusts have stolen from you. But it isn't until you bring those things out into the light. It was God's will to heal this guy. But the only reason he got the outcome that he was hoping for was when he chose to walk in courage. And guys, when we still have an ache in our heart, it can make trusting that God wants to heal us seem far-fetched. And the truth is that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when we hope for something for so long and we don't get it and we don't get it and we don't get it, it can make trusting that God wants to heal us seem far-fetched. And so we start to look to the external to satiate this internal hunger that we have that's really just pain that needs to be healed. And we won't heal what we won't talk about. I think that deserves being repeated. <laughs> We won't heal what we won't talk about. The days of putting on the mask, walking into church, praise God, brother, all things are good. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Let's talk about those things. Have you given up on God's process? Have you started to stick with cheap medicators that feel good temporarily? But in the long run, they rob your sense of joy and sense of esteem. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Amen. Just as your soul prospers. When God came to the earth, God in Abad, when Jesus showed up, he didn't just come to die on the cross to get you to heaven eventually. He came for you to experience the healing power, spirit, soul, and body. He came to heal that part of your heart that nobody knows about. That part that is so hurt, that part that is so wounded, that if anyone knew what you had gone through, they would be shocked. He wants to bring wholeness into that. He wants to establish you as the authentic version of yourself the one who's free from the enslaving effects of sin that rob us of joy. This is the life more abundant. This is what Jesus died for, for you to experience. Point number two, you're going to go through things. So enjoy the ride. <laughs> James 1 says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I hate that verse. <laughs> Nobody likes that verse. Count you. Jesus, when I'm going through a trial, I'm not so spiritual where I'm like, praise God, this is fantastic. <laughs> That's easy to quote for other people, isn't it? Oh, you're supposed to count it all joy, brother. <laughs> no, it hurts. It's painful. Romans 8.28 says that God works all things for our good. Those two verses are like kale to me. Like, it's like they taste awful. They really, really do. 
But if you'll eat it, if you let it into your heart, its truth will be made evident and you'll be healthier. Count it all joy. You see, the reason that God wants you to count it all joy when you encounter various trials is because God knows what is on the other side of a trial. God allows in his wisdom what he could prevent in his power. God allows in his wisdom what he could prevent in his power because he knows that the only way that he molds you into the image of his son is to allow you to fight a little bit. And we want to cling to comfort. We really do. Because pain is painful. But the truth is that you will never be the full measure of who God created you to be if you're running from his process. And you'll find yourself in this cycle of self-hate because you know that you were created for so much more. This is the process to wholeness. So I'm in New Orleans, hating life, not enjoying this experience whatsoever. And I remember the first day of training camp, I got a knock on my door. And it's this scout for the saints. And it's like 7.15 in the morning and meetings don't start till 8. And so he looks at me and he goes, hey, Sean Payton wants to talk to you. Sean Payton is the head coach of the New Orleans Saints. So I'm thinking, oh, good. I actually had some thoughts for Sean Payton. I wanted to run a few things by him. I saw some things with Drew Brees' throwing mechanics. I just want to tweak a little bit. I think with my help, this guy's got a future in this league. <laughs> and I, I have no idea that I'm literally walking into the Grim Reaper's office. <laughs> I was so naive. And I walk in, and I sit down, and Sean Payton is there, and he's kind of got this somber look on his face. And he said, Clint, we, uh, we've just signed our first round draft pick. We don't have any more room on the roster, and we're going to have to let you go. And I'm like, <laughs> no, 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 no. You say the Lord told me to be here? Like, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. The Lord said to be here, brother. And so that went pretty well. And uh, <laughs> he received that. And guys, I get in my car, and I've got a seven-hour drive from New Orleans back to Fort Worth, Texas, to just think about how I ruined my life. To just really sit there and think about, boy, I really messed this thing up. I had a guarantee, my dream, I had safety, I had security, had I just gone and done what seemed right and the natural. If I would have just leaned on my own understanding, I wouldn't be here today, God. <laughs> Where are you, Jesus? That thing that all of us do when things don't work out the way that we hope and expect them to because we fill in the gaps and we assume that God wants this and he really wants this. <laughs> and so I'm driving home thinking, it's like, what do I do now? I worked valet when I was in college. I could go back and make 10 bucks an hour doing that until I figure out what's next in my life. Plenty of time to think about how I ruined my life. And I get home, and 24 hours later, I get a call from the Seahawks. And they say, Clint, we've claimed your contract. We have a flight for you tonight in first class. Hello. I will take another loaf of bread. Bring me that Sprite in that glass. No plastic for me, my friend. We got practice tomorrow morning. Can you be there? I'm like, well, I got this car parking thing going on. I got a $5 tip the other day, my friend. Try and top that, Pete Carroll. <laughs> Guys, I go to the airport. I fly to Seattle. I get picked up at the airport by Pete Carroll's son. Now, 
When I was in high school, I wanted to play for Pete Carroll so bad. That was when they were at SC, they were going to all these national championships. It was my dream to play for Pete Carroll. And this is just a little side story I'm gonna tell you guys real quick. I asked my dad, Dad, I would love for you to send some highlight tape to USC, because I really wanna go there. And my dad came back to me a couple, year, or a couple of months later, this was my junior year of high school, and he said, you know, I never heard back from USC. Those guys are jerks out there. I guess we're just gonna have to stay somewhere close in the state. And my dad confessed in our 2011 Christmas card that he sent out to all of our friends that he forgot to send my highlight film off to SC because he didn't want me to go all the way to California. Like, thanks, Dad. Ruining my life, Dad. <laughs> That's what parents do, right? <laughs> Just trying to guide you to the right spot. <laughs> Dream, but don't dream too big. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so I wanted to play for SC so bad. So I'm in this car with Pete Carroll's son, and it's 12.30 at night. We're driving back to the hotel. Practice is the following morning at 7 a.m. or something. And as we're driving, his phone is on the dashboard, and it starts to ring, and it says Dad on it. And I'm kind of like, Ugh! <laughs> trying to not fangirl a little bit here. And he picks up the phone, and he's like, hey, Dad. Yeah, I just picked him up. He's right here. Oh, you want to talk to him? Sure. He hands me the phone, and I'm like... Hey, coach, how's it going? Yeah. Cool, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Like, trying hard to not fangirl about this, trying to look like I've been here before. But really, it was like the first couple of years of like, I cannot believe that I'm getting to hang out with Pete Carroll. And guys, that year... I make the team. They had a snapper that was there. They got rid of him. Get out. <laughs> My wife hears me tell this story all the time, and she always laughs so hard. It's so good for me. <laughs> we end up being the only team in NFL history to win our division that year with a losing record. It's never been done before. <laughs> We won our division with a losing record that year. Seven and nine never looked so good. We couldn't even get to 500, and we won our division. That is the favor of God, my friends. It's never been done, and it will never be done again in Jesus' name. This is the best part. This is the best part. The team that we beat in the first round of the divisional playoffs was the defending Super Bowl champions, the New Orleans Saints, the team that cut your boy. <sighs> Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I couldn't have done that, my friend. That was the favor of God. Did anybody happen to catch that game? Nobody, probably not. We're, you saw that game, yeah. Beast Quake happened in that game. And guys, I, th I think about where my life has gone since then. I got to be in a couple of Super Bowls. I got to play in enough playoff games for it to be its own NFL season. I met some of the best friends in the world. I met my precious wife, Maddie. And I trace all of that back to being on the phone with a spiritual father, a man who was speaking into my life, who said, I believe that you're hearing from God. And even though it makes no sense in the natural, even though everybody around you says, this is crazy, this is foolish, you're making a mistake, I believe that you're hearing from God. And because I had someone who believed in me and gave me the courage to step out of the boat, I'm now living in the manifestation of the promise because I chose to endure the process. Until you endure God's process, you will never enjoy his promise. Until you choose to stay there and get comfortable being uncomfortable, you will never have the full measure of what God wants to do in your life. Are you disciplined enough to trust God's character in the middle of his process? Or do we run? It's like Psalm 23, 
It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The reason David didn't fear any evil is because he chose to keep walking. If you choose to sit in the valley of the shadow of death and loiter in your pain and loiter in your disappointment and allow yourself to become a victim, which is really, really intoxicating sometimes because we want attention. We want people to empathize with us. We want people to have compassion for us. But there is this fine line between victim mentality We have to keep walking. We have to keep walking. And God wants to do the same thing for us. He doesn't want us to focus on the things that we don't have. He wants to focus on the things that he's told us to do. So point number three is you decide. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 through 20. It says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you <laughs> that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. <laughs> but what if it's not your will, Lord? No, 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 no. Therefore, you choose life. You have a choice. That's offensive sometimes. I don't like that because sometimes it just feels good to feel sorry for yourself. And for somebody who has historically struggled with this victim mentality where I really want attention from people because I didn't feel like I was ever worth it, this is a hard verse to swallow. Therefore, you choose life so that both you and your descendants may live, so that you may love the Lord your God, so that you may obey his voice, so that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, so that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to you. One of the most painful things that I have realized is that ultimately, it's our decision whether we stay stuck in our pain or grow. I'm not minimizing whatever it is that you've gone through. I'm really not. I'm actually maximizing and trying to speak to that thing that's in you, the Holy Spirit that says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, that you can do all things through Christ. We have to see ourselves as God sees us. We are no longer defined by our pain and our disappointment, and we decide... We decide. We need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I would always have this coach, this strength coach say that. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because if you're comfortable, you're regressing. This is true with everything in life. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're uncomfortable, if you're in a social situation and you feel uncomfortable, that means you're growing and it's a good thing. If you're working out and you're uncomfortable, that means that you're growing, and it's a good thing. We need to have a new relationship with pain and discomfort because your discomfort is the only thing that molds you into the image of his son, and you can't run from it anymore. Science says that you have as much willpower as you think you do. That's kind of a profound statement, but it's not that surprising. Willpower is a combination of courage, mental stamina, and determination. You have as much of that as you think you do. Well, of course, the Bible's been saying that for thousands of years. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen? If you believe that your painful situation is a life sentence to pain and depression and lack, it will be. And that's a really hard pill to swallow. But... If you believe that God is refining you, that your heavenly father, the God that you are in covenant with, is with you, it will grow you. It will grow you in ways that you need. It is our decision whether we stay stuck or grow. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Israel and... Um, 
it was a time of the year where there wasn't a whole lot of rain happening, and so all of the riverbeds were pretty much dried up. And at this one riverbed, they were talking about the battle between David and Goliath, you know, the most fantastic battle of coming up against our giants in our lives. And one thing that I thought was interesting about that story was that it says that David chose five smooth stones, that it specifically said smooth stones, because if he didn't choose a smooth stone, when he threw that rock he couldn't have trusted for that stone to accomplish its purpose in hitting Goliath square in the head. It would have veered off somehow. It had to be smooth to accomplish its purpose. Now, what I thought was interesting was we walk out into this riverbed, and over on the banks of the shore, all of the stones seem to have really rough edges on them. But as you step out further and further and further into the middle of the river, the stones got smoother. Now, why is that? Because some stones end up moving to the counterfeit safety of the shore where they're not getting bumped up against each other, where they're not getting refined, where they're not having those rough edges removed. The Bible says that we are like living stones. So we can choose to stay in the middle. We can choose to stay in our process. We can choose to allow God to refine us where we're rubbing up against each other and getting bumped up against each other and we're allowing God to refine us or we can run from his process and retreat to the counterfeit safety of the shore which feels good temporarily. But when Jesus comes and he says, I have an amazing plan that I wanna do through you and he walks out and he tries to find someone to use, is he gonna look at you and see that you have not had your smooth, your rough edges smoothed over. Amen. And maybe he'll pass over you. If we want to be used by God, we have to allow God to refine us and smooth those rough edges out so that when he throws us at his purpose, he can trust that we will accomplish it because we have not run from his process. Amen. It's our decision. Whatever you're going through is refining you. Whatever you're going through is refining you. In the summer of 1984, in the country of Nicaragua, there was a young woman who found herself in a very precarious situation. Uh, a situation that I think anybody would have a whole lot of compassion on. And in this country, there isn't a whole lot of infrastructure. There isn't a whole lot of education. There isn't a whole lot of support. And she found herself in a situation where the only way that she could provide a living for herself was to sell her body to carnivorous men, men who didn't care about her, men who were just trying to get their own needs for intimacy met men who wouldn't covenant their life to her and say, I will love you like Christ. I will daily die for you. And so this young 15-year-old girl, one day she finds herself pregnant. Doesn't know who the father is. It could be anyone. And so for months, she carries around this baby. No support, no one to help. And finally, she realizes nine months in that this baby is coming. And I don't know what to do about this. And so she looks out into the jungle and she sees a tree off in the distance. And so she walks over to this tree and she leans up against it. And she proceeds to give birth to this child onto the jungle floor. She looks down at her feet and she sees this thing that she feels so ashamed of. She hates this situation. She doesn't want anything to do with this. She picks up her child, her brand new baby, and she looks over and she sees an outhouse, a building that was designed for the collection of human waste. She starts to walk towards this and she can feel perspiration on the back of her neck and the cool jungle air is 
refreshing her as she realizes that she is almost rid of this thing. She opens up the door and she looks in and she takes her brand new baby, a gift from God, because children are a gift. Even before they're born, children are a gift. And she takes her brand new baby and she throws him into this hole. And as she turns away, she can hear the cries of her child. And to solidify that child's fate, to solidify this idea that I'm gonna run from this thing, I feel ashamed of it, she reaches down, she starts to pick up stones and starts to throw stones down into this hole because she feels so ashamed of this thing. As she leaves, she feels sanctified. She feels that she's rid herself of this thing. The next day, there were some children that were playing near this outhouse. And you see, the day before, they had taken a board and they had thrown it into this hole. And they hear the cries of a child. And so they're trying to figure out where this thing is coming from. And so they look around, they see the outhouse door, they, they open the outhouse door and they look down and they see a baby. And so they freak out and they run and they go tell their dad. They say, dad, dad, you gotta come help. There's a baby down in this hole. We need you to go down and get it. <laughs> and a father, a father comes and scales down into the mess that humanity made and reaches down and picks up this baby that had no way of getting out on its own. They take him to the hospital and there is not a single scratch on him. That baby had landed right on that board that those children had thrown into the hole the day before. And because a father scaled down into the mess and got this baby out, it's the most beautiful picture of what God has done in our life. A father came down from heaven into the mess that humanity made and said, I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to give you a life, a life more abundant. You had no way of getting out on your own. And because of the love of a father, <laughs> this child is rescued, not a single scratch on him. And I want to show you something. That's that baby. That's Mauricio. And that's the tree that he was born under. That was Mauricio's tomb. <laughs> you want to know what Mauricio's doing now? Mauricio runs a nonprofit in Nicaragua helping single moms. <laughs> Take that, devil! Mauricio had every single right in the world to live as a broken person who is forever stuck in their pain. And what Mauricio did was that he decided that I'm not going to allow my pain to define me. I am not going to allow my pain to make me stay stuck so that I can replicate what the devil did in my life to all of the people that I love the most. No, I am going to choose life. I am going to choose joy. I am going to choose wholeness because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And no matter what the devil has done to you to try and destroy your life, God is greater. He is bigger. He wants to bless your life and show you the love of a father. We have a decision to make. We can get back in the river or we can run from God's process. In the same way that this man had a withered hand, he felt so ashamed of this thing, and he retreated. He wanted to keep this thing hidden his entire life because he felt ashamed of it. And Jesus comes up to him and says, I want you to show me that thing that you feel ashamed of. I want you to bring that thing out into the light. And when you have the courage to expose that, group, it will get restored. You will get restored. But it's a choice. And it's a daily choice that we have to make that I will not allow the pain and my disappointment with people and the rejection that I have experienced and the abuse that I have walked through. No, 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 no. There is a good God who loves you and he wants to refine you. 
And so this morning, I'm going to invite you to have a private moment with the Lord. And I believe that this is all of our stories. And if, if you'll just close your eyes, and there's nothing super spiritual about closing your eyes. It just gives you the opportunity for privacy in a moment like this. And I think for so many of us, we have allowed our pain to be our identity. We have allowed what people have done to us be the thing in which we view the entire world through. And today is a new day. God's doing a new thing in your life. And if that's you, and if you wanna say, I'm no longer gonna let that define me. I'm gonna choose to get back into the river. I'm going to choose to bring my withered hand out into the light, trusting that because I walk in courage, God will restore me and make me whole. I'm just gonna invite you to slip your hand up real quick. Slip your hand up real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, this is all of our stories. It is a daily decision. Thank you, thank you. Well, Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that you're a good God who chose to scale down into the mess that all of us made and we had no way of getting out on our own. Thank you that you love us, that you're growing us and refining us. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.